here to talk about Spectrum for 4G, 5G, uh, private industrial radio. Uh, quite a few different bands that are available, and uh, you know we'll go through them. Um, please stop me if you have questions. If you think I'm wrong about something, that actually makes it particularly more interesting. Everybody's just had their first cup of coffee, so that would be good. Uh, and you know, give, give me your suggestions. So, as Louis said, uh, we've been in this business now over a decade. I used to uh, run half the Spectrum group for uh, Print Nextel, and then uh, that Spectrum was sold off to another party, and I decided that was a good time to start a Spectrum brokerage business. And uh, I'm pleased to say we're now seven employees. We've got some, some very good folks, um, some of whom know the details about this, uh, particularly the individual bands better than I do. So I will do my best to, to go through um, uh, the different bands and also uh, to answer your questions. But I will also be glad to put you in touch with, with an expert, uh, you know, if there's a topic I don't know. So uh, we're, we're going to talk, you see here, there's uh, narrowband and broadband, two different topics. Could I maybe show of hands, who's, who's interested in narrowband uh, opportunity? That's not a lot of excitement. Who's interested in broadband opportunities? Uh, okay, so I think we'll focus on broadband today. I'm, I will flip through the, the narrowband stuff if it's okay real quickly. Uh, stop me if there's there's something that is, is of less interest. And the idea here is start low, work through the different bands, work up uh, to, to the top. So uh, in the VHF channels, these are kind of hard to find, it's a bit noisy, high power, uh, <coughs> primarily voice voice services. Um, there are still some left, right? So if you're looking to expand a system, something like that, uh, you can get it. Based on the, the feedback from the group, I'm going to skip over this one. The AMGS actually is a pretty interesting topic. So first of all, there's full two megahertz in the band, basically two one megahertz channels, 500 kilohertz up and down. Uh, they can be used either TDD or FDD, they're high power. Uh, mostly these have been used for voice services, but they're also avail available for data services. So basically we put this spectrum on sale and um, you know, we'll ask for lower prices than what previously have been accepted. Since then, we've announced three deals. There's more in the works. Uh, Indiana, uh, positive train control, and, and uh, interestingly, Denver, Texas, uh, Encore uh, has just uh, filed their, their transaction to acquire these frequencies. So um, if you're looking for uh, kind of a discount opportunity, they're still available in most, most of the country. There is a, another party that has these, these channels as well, but it's, it's not the receivership. So there's a chance for a little negotiation there. Uh, great propagation, uh, low noise environment, um, uh, and uh, you know there is essentially there's one land mobile radio company that actually has sold product. There's a couple others that have announced uh, that Tate is, is the company there, um, and uh, you know a number of companies, GE, uh, and others have uh, the 20 megahertz data product as well. So pretty pretty interesting um, in this band. Uh, 218, 219, um, very limited availability. There happens to be some in Houston and Dallas. Uh, so if you wanted to do something in the city, this is this is uh, the city and the metro areas. Um, these licenses, similar propagation, obviously. This actually sits in the middle of the AMCS band between the 217 version and the 219 version. Um, and uh, it's, it's a TDD band, uh, plenty of capacity there for uh, the 220, 222 megahertz service, uh, this has again been a long, around for a long time. Challenge in this is most of the channels are just five kilohertz wide. So very narrow band in order to get even up to uh, 12 and a half kilohertz, you need to find three of them together. Um, again, uh, available at, at uh, relatively uh, good prices as it just become uh, kind of less popular over time. A anybody else? Yes, sir. Quick question, are these uh, TDD or FDD? These, these are FDD channels, I believe. Um, they're, they're paired uh, and, you know, two, two five kilohertz chunks. So, um, uh, yeah, that, you know, you have that. It's not a big separation difference. It's, you know, two, two megahertz, or actually it's one megahertz in between the top and the bottom of the band. So, uh, and on a single channel, can you even do voice communication on five kilohertz? There are, there are solutions that can do voice. Okay, 450, probably people, some people are operating 450 megahertz uh, networks. Uh, typically, these are uh, voice services. There 
there are additional channels, not lots of places available. Most of this stuff has kind of been in use. You know, people are happy with it. Uh, not lots of changes going on there. So that's, that's uh, uh, it's, it's available. It's paired channels, uh, 25 kilohertz effectively. Um, lots of people are very happy with the services that they get on this. And, and uh, you know, if you have a voice network and are ever thinking of expanding, I'd say, you know, check to see if you can get the channel. All right, uh, in other venues, I'm sort of known for to be the upper 700 megahertz guy. <laughs> and, and we've sold these licenses, including in Texas to Centerpoint here in Houston, uh, to Encore, uh, and then Enterprise Products has acquired these licenses uh, in, in West Texas to be able to support their operations and oil and gas uh, operations. There's still some left in Texas. There's still two thirds of the country left. Uh, but more than 20, uh, mostly utilities have acquired this. California High Speed Rail um, has, has acquired this. There's, we recently sold one to a company called Blockchain, which I think is planning to build a smart city uh, situation in, in Nevada. Uh, so total of two megahertz in the band, this comes sort of as the whole band. One, one megahertz comes from megahertz sound, can be operated at PD or TVD. And this is what I used to call wideband, categorizing it within the narrow band uh, area. Um, but uh, uh, it, it has, you know, substantially more capacity than, than typical <coughs> narrow band uh, solutions. All kinds, of, there's like 20 different, uh, maybe not 20, 14 different companies, I think, that are building equipment for this band. So it's been quite a success over the, the past several years. The new news uh, in 700 is that uh, as of uh, the beginning of this month, it's official, official 3GPP approval, so it is now an, an NBIOT band and uh, can be operated sort of as part of a 4G, 5G system. Right? So NBIOT is the uh, focus on Internet of Things, only 200 kilohertz wide channels, so you can fit four of them actually in, within the megahertz here, uh, you know, paired system, very low cost, long battery life, uh, you know, you're talking 10, maybe 20 years, depending on how often that uh, system wakes up to, to uh, communicate uh, low speed data, right, not, we're talking about kilobits per second, uh, 15 kilobits per second, kind of, kind of speed, um, and, and typically kind of first speed. So, uh, if you've got equipment out in the field that doesn't need to, to send a lot of information, but you need to know once a day, once an hour, what it's doing, this, this could be a very, very good solution. Uh, and, and we're seeing um, some of this. There's another session later today, if, if he's made it in on his trip, uh, to talk about this. Um, I think they're, they're looking at some um, gas fields off of uh, monitoring type of applications. Uh, so I encourage you to check with, with him at a, a company called Flow. This So within the narrow band space, I, I am a little biased, I admit to this test, but nonetheless, in terms of what the, the market is saying, this has been uh, an important new entry, and I would encourage you to uh, to check it out um, and see if it's available and, and how it might help folks. All right, so um, narrow band PCS is another channel. There's another broker who you can get this to get this from, it's, it is kind of a fragmented uh, availability of, of what's out there. Up to 1.4 megahertz is probably achievable in different blocks uh, around the band. Part of it is FDD, part of it is, is PDD, uh, and it has been used, um, I don't know so much in the oil and gas business. Census uses some of this in, in their network. Uh, so, you know, it has been used in successful networks. And I think, Oh, so yeah, we, we did do kind of a comparison, um, and, and these slides will be available, I'm sure, if you have trouble getting it from, from NPLEC, you can get it from me, but sort of, you know, different applications along the left, different frequencies, uh, and, and, you know, kind of relative comparisons, uh, you know, what's the relative propagation of the different bands, the darkest green is the best, the red is, is uh, look out, you know, maybe, maybe some issues. Maybe some issues here. Um, one of the one of the uses of neuroband would be to control drones, not necessarily to get real time video, but but drone control. So you can see that 
not all frequencies are recorded by that. Um, so just, I don't know if anybody has a particular comment or, uh, or observation on this. I know the focus was more on the broadband. But uh, kind of worthwhile as you look at these. In general, more green is better according to the opinion of, of folks in my company. Hey, Bob. Yeah. Oh, field area network. <clears throat> so a common term in the electric uh, utility industry, right? And the uh, concept, you know, a lot of these electric utilities or silos organizations, they have built multiple different networks to support the different applications. And so there's a big push that can be done on these frequencies, on particularly on the 700, um, or go to broadband and support a wide range. There are the companies, some of the companies, many of the companies that, that support the, the narrow band communication. Yes, sir. Um, in the context of when you say that the good news is that you have a 3GPP band supported for the, for the, block, seven, right? for the 700. Yes, so, um, and we understand that it's uh, PCS 900. Has there been any discussion of aggregating? between the multiple bands because these are small, small bands. The aggregation to get the higher bandwidth, right? Um, ha has there been any discussion, any work item? Are you aware of or being, being, um, being heard about or have you seen that feedback coming from the people? So um, in, in IEEE, there is an effort called 8016T uh, that is essentially narrow channel YMAX mm -hmm. to pick up all these slices. And I'm, I'm somewhat involved in that. And it's getting support from the likes of Siemens. And you know, Ondas is kind of the lead company within, within that. Um, so you know, I think that is very relevant for private networks. The railroads seem to be pretty interested in, in that. Yeah. Um, so that is, is going on. Within the 3G PP standards, kind of where most people are going, right? The, the, there's been a lot of discussion for me mostly, <laughs> but others as well, for a long time to say, if you have the 700 narrow band, you can have a wide coverage, right? If you need broadband in places, then CBRS would be a really good solution. And now we're talking about the 1.6 gigahertz, which I'll get to in a, in a minute. So um, you know, <coughs> that is how carriers build their networks, right? Your Verizon phone, if you're out in the boonies or at and works on 700 megahertz uh, spectrum typically. If you're in a city, more likely it's working on midband, the dot nine, something like that. If you're in a, an arena these days, you're gonna get 5G up in the millimeter wave. So, so uh, uh, in particular, T-Mobile calls it layer cake, right? Lowest frequency, widest coverage, but, but capacity issues, you need a lot of capacity, higher frequency frequency. That's how they build okay. Um I think that will happen in other networks. Broad coverage and lower frequencies, which you can do on some of these narrowband frequencies. And we do, in fact, that's my session at, at UTC. So come to Oklahoma City in two months, and, and, or one month, and you'll see that. So 600 megahertz was an auction <coughs> that didn't go terribly well for the FCC. FCC. It went well for T Mobile. T Mobile has a lot of things here. It went reasonably well for Dish. Um, and, and in much of the country, um, it's basically T-Mobile and Comcast or T-Mobile and Charter or something like that and you can't get it. But in places where they didn't buy, and in particularly in rural areas, and I think it would include some energy production areas, there may be 600 megahertz spectrum available and it's likely in the hands of an investor who bought it at auction with the expectation that they were going to sell it to T-Mobile or AT&T or Verizon. Well, AT&T and Verizon aren't in this band. And you know, Dish is kind of just coming along, trying to decide what really what it's going to do. And they have, a, they have more frequency than customers, right? They have more spectrum than customers. So um, it's possible that you could get some of this. And if you can get it, it's five by five, great propagation, lots of devices, three GPP. It's it's really really good stuff. So uh, we don't current. Well, we, we do represent one or two holders of this. We don't have a lot of um, places around the country, but we can tell you if it. If you say, hey, I want it here in this county, this county, this county, um, we can tell you whether it might be available or not and who has it, and we'd be glad to work with you to talk, talk to those investors. If it's in the hands of um, uh, T-Mobile or Comcast,
common path, you probably don't have enough uh, voltage <coughs> that you need to get it out of your hand. But that, that's my opinion, and you know, you, we can always make a call. But potentially, really good spectrum. What? Not going to be terribly cheap. All right, uh, the 900 megahertz broadband, um, this is, uh, uh, earlier Louis mentioned, um, this used to be part, I used to be responsible for this when I was at Nextel and Sprint, this particular spectrum. It was kind of the narrow slicey stuff that, that used to be the Nextel push to talk service, if you guys remember that. Um, when they, when Nextel and, and Sprint merged and then uh, Sprint said, listen, you know, this isn't really, this narrow channel stuff isn't really part of our plans, they sold it all off to the founder of Nextel and, and they are attempting to take all of the little narrow slices and put them all back together. And they've got 3GPP approval and they've got three customers so, so far. They've done some significant transactions. Um, so far they've cleared 21 counties out of the 3,000 that we have in the US for, for broadband. So they have a, a long way to go in terms of actually getting this clear. But um, they're making a lot of uh, good marketing efforts and, and they have some very qualified folks, I'm sure, will be successful over time. All right. Um, 1.6 gigahertz, basically that, this is the major reason I'm here, by the way. So Legato has the 1.6 gigahertz spectrum, it's total of 35 megahertz, 30 in this L band, which is approved for a year and a half as band 24 by 3GPP, available nationwide, used to be satellite spectrum, uh, and they went to the FCC, they said, okay, we want to pull off a portion of our spectrum and use it for terrestrial purposes. The FCC said okay, it was back and forth with um, different adjacent holders, GPS folks were concerned with the GPS and the C system in the middle. In the end, it was resolved by backing away, you know, creating a guard band and lowering the power. So great spectrum, lots of capacity. The power limits are low, like uplink is 200 milliwatts uh, ERP. So, um, EIRP, I'm sorry. So, uh, it, this, this could be very, very good spectrum. <coughs> By the way, it's leased, not buy, because it's a satellite license overall, so they have to maintain that satellite license. They'll lease it to you for as long as you want. Um, but uh, if you want broadband, particularly kind of small cell broadband, uh, this, this is a great opportunity. And it has been supported by Qualcomm and, and uh, you know, major manufacturers. Um, Nokia and Mavenir have announced products. They're, they're going to be uh, demonstrating those products in the case of Mavenir this quarter, in the case of Nokia next quarter. Uh, so things, things are kind of after a long period of development and lots of interest in broadband for private uh, networking. Um, this, this is now uh, out and available and, and uh, worth having a uh, look at. All right, uh, so the other part of the 1.6 gigahertz band is uh, I, only, a, only a spectrum guy could love this name, the 1670 to 1675 megahertz band. <laughs> if anybody has a better suggestion for a name, please let me know. Um, but uh, this is the high power portion of the band. So L band 30 megahertz, this is just five, five megahertz TDD, but it is, it's uh, submitted for uh, 3GPP approval. I was hoping that we would actually have a band number. The L band, by the way, is band 24. Um, I was hope, hoping we'd have that in time for this. Check with me, stop by the booth, right? And, and uh, we'll uh, let you know if I'm able to announce that tomorrow. I was gonna check on that yesterday, except I seem to spend a fair amount of time touring the country on an airplane. Um, and uh, and uh, this is in the process. So not yet 3GPP approved, no uh, formally announced uh, manufacturer, although Nokia was mentioned in the press release that, that we had you know, uh, as uh, somebody that uh, Legato is talking to about this. Um, so uh, this is, because of the higher power, because five megahertz is frankly more affordable than 30, this may be a better fit uh, for, for this industry in a lot of cases. It's got a little while before uh, the equipment's available and you can put it in place. All right. Uh, 2.5 gigahertz band, this is what I uh, did at Nextel and Sprint, mostly Worldcom before that. Um, I have a lot of affection for this band. Uh, it's, there's an auction coming up, right? So there's uh, very soon, by the way, within I think a week and a half or something like that. The original spectrum in the, all the cities, Houston, Dallas, major, major city, 
even you know, smaller, much smaller markets than that, is held principally by people. A lot of it's leased, um, but they're, they have a tie to sort of long-term lease. The FCC is having a kind of a leftovers auction. So um, auction one away is, is uh, what's, what's coming up. So um, there may be a chance to get more of this out in circulation. If you scurry really quickly, you might be able to get your act together in time to, to submit the short form on May 10th. Um, and in some places, uh, this, this is good up to 50 megahertz in a channel. Uh, I won't take you through all of, all of the details here. The real question is if it's available in your area, um, it's, it's worth taking a look at. And um, so that, that's what's going, going on, on there. Uh, the one uh, spectrum band that you probably know best, you've been paying attention to the kind of news over the past couple of years, CBRS. Are folks out there operating either 3.65 networks in, in some service today? I'm just seeing some nodding of heads. Or you've heard about CBRS, you're, you're thinking about, about this. Um, so, total 150 megahertz, 80%, uh, well, 80 megahertz available for so called GAA use, general authorized availability, general authorized access, uh, the other 70 under uh, so called primary access license, PAL license. Uh, we are seeing you know, fast take up. If you're in the GAA space, you may be seeing some challenges uh, getting channels uh, and and uh, you know noise issues and, and that kind of thing. Um, we we are representing. First of all, we bought some pals, uh, folks that, that we're affiliated with. It's not officially under the select spectrum name, but it's, it's us. Uh, and and secondly, uh, we represent uh, pal holders. I think altogether we have something like 400 licenses across the country. By the way, you can go on our website and there's a search function and you can pick your band and your location and it'll show you <coughs> at least what we know is available uh, for acquisition. Um, in this case, it is a tiered access, so the government has the, the primary rights. Uh, essentially, they can kick you off uh, if they need to. There's some earth station areas where you have to uh, be careful where you operate. Uh, Near the coast, you could have potentially naval radar come in and kick you off. And the SAS, the Spectrum Availability System, uh, controls all of this. You have to pay for the SAS, right? So it's a monthly fee or it's a built into the cost of the equipment. Federated Wireless is, is an operator here. So is Google, but unlike Google, for, as we all know, they're not giving it away for free. You have to pay, pay for, for the SAS services. Um, but it is a way that you can build a wireless network pretty much anywhere. You may have different levels of challenge depending on where you are in terms of the, uh, the interference issues. The power levels are not that high. The propagation, is, as we go up the frequency band, right, the propagation gets, gets smaller. Uh, so there are some, some challenges in this band. Lots of equipment availability, um, which is uh, you know, a big plus. Uh, so if, if you need to do something right away, this is a good place to look. So again, uh, darker green is, is a better situation. Uh, we don't have any red on this slide, which is, which is a good thing. This is our, our view um, along the vertical axis. We have a 3GPP standardization, not required, but because there are excellent industrial radio suppliers, but it has, has advantages in many situations. Propagation, the next channel down, most of these propagate pretty well. You see the higher frequencies, not quite as well as the lower frequencies. Um, channel width. So channel width is worth mentioning. Um, the minimum, at least today, to be in the 5G standard and, and the, what the 5G standard was, was designed for was wider channel width. The minimum they said was 5 megahertz. So if you have less than 5, and some of these systems, or at least one of these systems, comes in blocks of less than 5, you are essentially capped at 4G. And if people think about it, you know, now that we're putting in 5G systems, 3G, 3G systems are coming out, right? Everybody's got a 4G phone. If you're changing out phones every three years, that's no big deal. <coughs> if you're trying to run an industrial system, um, you know, you may be concerned about putting in 4G, which I would say is kind of a five year, or, I'm sorry, 10 years more like from, from now. 5G's are 
already coming in more like 20 years before flight. So at least something to, to think about. Um, throughput, all of these are good. You know, higher frequencies uh, with more bandwidth are, are even better. In building penetration kind of goes with propagation better on the lower frequency end. And, uh, you know, the one we pay a lot of attention to is how available is it, right? So in the end, it only matters whether it's available or you want it, right? So, so come and see, but uh, we're excited about the Legato spectrum because it is available nationwide and it's available today. Uh, so that's, that's good news. In terms of suppliers, you know, everybody's building for, for broadband. But uh, uh, you know, there's more and more uh, uh, coming along. All right, so uh, we have time for questions, including for people who came in late. If, I, if, if you missed something, feel free to ask a question of, uh, that, in terms of interest in the spectrum.